Uh, it's great to be back in Oxford, where I did my undergraduate degree. Um, haven't been back for a while, so it's, it's great to see everyone here. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit, so less about the process about the SDGs and more about uh, what evidence we have about the best ways to achieve some of the objectives. Um, and I'm going to focus on education and health, partly because that's where I've done a lot of work, but also because that's where we have the strongest evidence base about how to achieve uh, the objectives. So starting with education, oh, there seems to be some slight changes in formatting as it's moved over to this computer, so let's hope that uh, that's not too much of an issue. But I want to just draw a contrast between the, what, we, what was focused on in the Millennium Development Goals, which in education was primarily about access to education. So you had the goal of, of universal access to primary education and also uh, equal access between, uh, between boys and girls. And what is the focus of the Sustainable Development Goals, which is really about quality of education. Uh, but let me just start by, by you know, pausing. I was in the, in the session earlier when, when the question was asked, who thinks that the uh, MDGs were success? And I was one of the few who put up my hands. And one of the reasons is the tremendous improvements in access to education, which I just want to pause and kind of recognize for a second. Because in the particularly in the poorest countries in the world, we've seen a really dramatic change. So where a generation ago, it was an exception for girls to school. So in many of the places where I'm working in, um, in Sierra Leone, you have 70% of the adult population have zero years of education. So really, they never went inside. The, you know, the average person in rural Sierra Leone never went inside a school. And yet, it's... it's you know, the exception not to be in school now in, in these countries. So that is really in one generation we've seen a complete radical change in terms of access to education. Now, uh, most, more, in most countries, more days of school are lost, because, not because kids are out of school, because they fail to attend regularly. And that's something I think um, we have to focus on too. It's not just getting people enrolled, we have to get them to turn up because a lot of the poorest children are not turning up regularly to school. Um, not only did we make progress on access, we also made a lot of progress in understanding how to improve access. So just you know, a few examples of randomised trials and what they showed is that reducing the costs of education, that, uh, and that's not just paying for school, but people have to pay for books and uniforms, and they often have to pay for report cards and PTA fees. All of these costs add up, and reducing those costs can ha have a big impact on improving access. Also, we found that people often don't understand either the costs of schooling or the benefits, and simply providing information about either the costs or benefits of education is another area where across many different countries we've seen big improvements in attending school once you provide people with that information. And finally, just a 10 cents deworming pill can have a dramatic impact on, on children going to school in, in areas where, uh, where parasitic worms is, is a big problem, which is a lot of, a lot of poor countries. Overall, this research showed something that's quite surprising if you're sort of a classically trained economist, which is, uh, and something that I'm going to come back to, is that small changes could have really quite big impacts on whether children are going to school, which if you think about the investment of going to school, it's hundreds of hours um, over a year, and you know, over the course of a school, uh, a school child's life, it's a huge investment to go to school, and yet you know, just a 10 cents deworming pill or getting a free uniform can have a big impact. And that starts to tell us something about, you know, that maybe our classical economics models aren't exactly accurate. But let me turn to what is the focus of the sustainability goals, which is about quality education and particularly about learning. And there's a real challenge in learning. 
uh, and it's kind of the obvious next step after you've got kids in school to focus on this challenge. These are just two examples. One is from a survey in Sierra Leone, which looked at 350 disadvantaged schools, and you can see that about 80% of third and fourth graders, only 80% can add 3 plus 6. And only 20% can divide 15 by 3. So there's obviously something very seriously going wrong if a fourth grader can't divide 15 by 3. Then there's some really important work that's coming out of a group in Oxford, the Young Lives Group, which they're following children over time, and they're also asking the same questions from different generations of students, which is really unique. And they are finding that learning levels are actually declining in many countries, which is really scary. So this is from a state in, in India, and you see that this, you know, on the same test given to 12-year-olds in 2006, the same test given in 2013, people are performing dramatically worse. 12-year-olds are performing dramatically worse years later. And that's very scary. And particularly that the poorest, that yellow line at the bottom is the poorest, their declines were worse than anyone else. So what's going on and what can we do to improve it? So if you just look at a school in Kenya, in one in the US, you will see some obvious initial differences. If you look at those two pictures, you would notice that you know, in Kenya, they don't have any textbooks, they don't have materials, they don't have a computer, there are many kids in the class, uh, and so the ratio of teachers to kids is very different in developing countries. And you might think, well, you know, so the obvious place to start is to, to provide those things that are obviously missing when you, when you go into a classroom. Well, in randomized trials have looked at trying to improve those inputs, and, you know, they... They've added, in some schools, they provided textbooks, no increase in, in test scores. They provided more teachers, no increase in test scores. They provided computers, no increase in test scores. And then maybe we were giving the wrong input. So maybe we should just give the school money that they can choose how to spend in the school. No increase in test scores. So... This is suggesting that maybe our model about what to do about learning is a little bit more complicated than just those lack of inputs. So what I'm going to talk about next is a systematic review of, um, of the evidence on what impacted learning in schools, what worked to improve learning in schools in developing countries. And so I just have to give you a little bit of background of understanding the results that I'm going to show. When we're trying to compare studies in many different countries at different age levels, the tests on learning are going to be, they're going to be different tests in different schools. So how am I going to compare the results from one school to another? Well, the only thing that you can do is put them on a, to put them on a single scale, really, is to measure standard deviations. And I know that's not a very intuitive concept for the people who aren't economists in the room. So let me just explain. Point, a standard deviation is about how you move in the distribution. Um, just to give you a benchmark, 0.2 standard deviations improvement in test scores is seen as a you know, pretty important change in test scores. It would move someone from being the 50th percentile. So you imagine kids lined up you know, from the highest test score to the lowest, and you take the middle one. A 0.2 standard deviation improvement would move them from being the 50th to the 58th. So, you know, if you think about kids in a school, you're moving from the 50th to the 58th. That's what it means, a 0.2 standard deviation. But whether that's a, you know, a good improvement depends on how much money you spent to move them from the 50th to the, 50, uh, to the 58th. So what I'm going to look at in these coming charts is how many standard de deviations of learning can I move for spending $100? And again, to give you some sort of basic benchmarks, um, spending $100 and getting one standard deviation improvement is seen as good value for money. Why? Because if you think about a kid being in school all year, sort of the best that they can do probably is about one standard deviation. You know, that's how much a kid moves. In a decent school moves from, you know, the third grade to the fourth grade. They move the equivalent of one standard deviation. Now, in the, when I show these results to an audience that has American education researchers in them, they think I've got the decimal point wrong. Because 
you know, a program that's seen as very effective in the US is the Tennessee Star randomized trial. And there, they moved 0.05 of a standard deviation for $100. So when I'm going to show you things that are like one, two standard deviations, that is massively more effective than, you know, a good program in the US, which basically just tells you we should be spending more money in developing countries. 